Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, I'm continuing the study of the book of John, and we're beginning with chapter 8, verse 1 tonight. I'm going to go as far as I can, and uh, if you did not see the previous studies on John, they are uplo oh, already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Now, I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it in the KJV first, and then I'll probably look at it in the Amplified Translation. Sometimes I find that to be helpful. All right. John, chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went unto them out of olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that, should, uh, that such should be stoned. What, uh, but what sayest thou? There's a lot already in the very... First few verses here. Um, so Jesus is teaching in Jerusalem, either at the temple or near the temple. And they bring him a woman caught in adultery. And it says that she was caught in the very act. And they caught in the very act. Um, that would mean that they're... Um, they would actually have to have witnessed the uh, act of adultery. Uh, it's interesting to me uh, that they don't bring the man along with the woman. If she was caught in the act, where's the man? Why are they singling out the woman and not bringing the man? Isn't he equally guilty? Uh, so, uh, they ask what him. They say he's, uh, she's guilty of adultery. We've caught her in the very act. Moses says that she should be stoned. What do you say? Let me read this in the Amplified, see how it phrases it. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came back into the temple court, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began teaching them. Now the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman uh, who had been caught in adultery. They made her stand in the center of the court, and they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women to death. So what do you say uh, to do with her? What is your sentence? Well, there's really nothing substantially different there in that translation. Uh, a lot of the times when they come to Jesus with a question like this, it's uh, there's a ulterior motive. They're doing it to try to uh, catch him, to trap him. It, it says that at some point in the scriptures that that's what they're attempting to do. When they asked him uh, about paying taxes to Caesar, that was a trick question to try to catch him, to trip him up. No matter what he answered, which way he answered, uh, he'd either be guilty by the, uh, according to the Jews or he'd be guilty according to the Romans, they thought. So this is another thing that they're trying to uh, find reason. They're just trying to build up a case against him so that they can do what they want to do, kill him. Uh, let me go on. KJV verse, um, verse 6. says, this they said, tempting him. Okay. Yeah. See, this very next verse is explaining exactly the point I just made. It says, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. They're just trying to lay a trap for him, in other words. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Well, this is very interesting because he was accused earlier in an earlier chapter of being unlearned. 
uh, how they, they said, how is he able to teach the way he does? He's an unlearned person. They assumed that he could not read or write for some reason. And here we have an example of Jesus writing. He's writing in the sand something. There's a lot of theories about what he could possibly be writing. I've heard it said that uh, he, the people who are the accusers, uh, he's looking at them and he's writing down, you know, hypocrisy, lying, uh, you know, covetousness, all these different things. And he's looking at them and he's, he knows what sins they're guilty of. He's listing them so that they'll see that and say, oh, we can only guess. We can only theorize about what he wrote. But this shows that Jesus was able to write. He certainly was able to read when he goes to the temple and reads the prophecy and said, this day, this prophecy is fulfilled. He read, and here we see he, he could write. So uh, he, he was not some ignorant hick the way that some people portray him. And uh, uh, But they want him to sentence her. To give him a judgment. What should be done with her? Moses says, stone her. So now it says, uh, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the, a stone at her. Let him first cast a stone at her. So it may be said, let, let him cast the first stone. But in KJV, it says, let him first cast a stone at her. So any of you who has never sinned, go ahead. You can cast the first stone. Let me see how it's phrased in the Amplified. Verse 7 says, however, when they persisted in questioning him, he straightened up and cried, he who is without any sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. What would you do? There's some people that I, I deal with here on YouTube that might argue that, okay, I'll throw this stone. It seems like the, a lot of people on YouTube, they want to spend all the time casting stones at believers. They say they're a believer and they want to judge other people and they're always casting their stones, verbal stones, accusations, challenges, whether they're truly saved. And I think that some of you, some of the people that are doing that today, if you were there, perhaps you would have actually thrown the stone because you can't admit that you are a sinner. You still sin. You are not without sin. No matter how much you believe you've repented of your sins, no matter how much you think you've changed your life, you, you've surrendered your life to, to Christ, and now you're a disciple, a follower, and so on. All these claims that you make. Can you say you're without sin? Can you cast the first stone? Let me continue reading in the KJV. It says, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Aren't you curious about what he was writing? And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. So, apparently, they were not so self-righteous that they could actually claim that they were without sin, like the rich young ruler. He was saying he's kept the law since he was a youth. And then Jesus said, well, sell everything you own and give it to the poor then and come and follow me if you want to really be, uh, really be good. Uh, but when, when really confronted, if a person truly examines themselves honestly, they find out they must admit, no, I'm guilty too. And he says, if, you, if you're innocent, if you've never sinned, if you have no sin, go ahead. You can cast the first stone. And they all understand. They're sinners too. And they leave. And there she is with Jesus. Let me read this in the Amplified. Um, he stooped down again and started writing on the ground. They listened to his reply. And they began to go out one by one, starting with the oldest ones until he was left alone 
with the woman standing there before him in the center of the court. Now, I wonder why, starting with the oldest ones, were, were the older ones maybe uh, a little more mature, maybe a little wiser? They were the first to come to their sentence, sense, senses and realize that Jesus' statement, if you haven't sinned, you can cast the first stone, because they were older and wiser, perhaps they first realized that they're not qualified to cast that stone. And then the, the younger ones finally left too. Um, in verse 10, the KJV says, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, there are, there are the people that I argue with every day, that I rebuke, rebuke and denounce every day, that uh, denounce the doctrine of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone, they say faith in Jesus is insufficient. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to change your life and you've got to be, follow the commandments and so on and so on. Their list goes on and on. Things that you must do. Faith in Jesus is not enough, they say. Well, no. this they would take this verse here and say, see, he said to her, go and sin no more. Don't, have, don't commit any more sins. Well, if you cannot see that in the context of what's going on, he's not talking about sin as a whole in your life. He's saying, don't repeat this. You got in trouble here. You are almost stoned to death. Fortunately, they asked me to judge, and now you, you're, you're, you're free to go, and you, they didn't stone you. Learn your lesson, and don't do the same thing again. Go and sin no more. Just reply, uh, applies to this one act. He's not telling her to not ever sin again because he knows it's impossible throughout this whole book throughout the bible uh, jesus is teaching us that it's impossible to live a sinless life that's why his apostles finally asked him they said well lord well, based on what you're saying tell us how is it possible for anyone to be saved and he said with man it is impossible that's what we all must learn. We must understand it is impossible to get saved based on our own efforts, our own merit. Uh, but he says, but with God, all things are possible. We can be saved with God by relying on God. Jesus is God and Savior. When we rely on him, we get saved. But based on our own efforts, it's impossible. And that's what he's saying here. Go and sin no more. Don't repeat this sin. Don't commit adultery more. Come back here, you know, hopefully in thinking that uh, you got away with it this time. Don't. Learn from your mistake. He's not saying don't go for the rest of your life and never sin again because that is impossible to do. Now, let me read that in the Amplified. It'll be interesting to see if they agree with this or not. Uh, it says, verse 10 in the Amplified, straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She answered, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Okay. So you can see how the Amplified, you can get up further uh, um, infer from it that uh that is talking about go and live a sinless life but that's that that's not what he's saying and that's not what the the context applies to and that's that's also doesn't agree with all of his other teachings his teaching is it's impossible to go the rest of your life without sinning so verse 12 in the kjv says then spake jesus again unto them saying i am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. Uh, I'll read that in the Amplified. Verse 12 in the Amplified says, Once more Jesus addressed the crowd. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Yeah, so true. So true. Uh, now, 
the reason Jesus came down from heaven is, is clear. He says, do not think I came to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. So uh, he didn't come here so people could be serving him. He came to serve us. He washed the feet of the apostles as an example of what, if you want to be great, you want to be the greatest, then become the servant of all. Then you'll be the greatest in the kingdom. He served. He set an example of service, loving your fellow man and serving them. He gave us that as an example. But really, the, the primary mission is clear. He says, to give my life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. He died on a cross. He paid the ransom. He, he, he died paying for our sins. He, his, his suffering, his shed blood, his death on the cross paid for our sins. And that we are set free from condemnation. Because he says, the scripture says, if you uh, believe in the Son, you're not condemned. But if you do not believe in the Son, you are condemned already. Because you have not believed in the name of the, the, the Son of God. If you don't believe in the name of Jesus, in the, the name Jesus tra literally translates to God saves. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Savior God, and you rely on him for your salvation, then you, you remain condemned. But he, he died to, to uh, give up, pay the ransom so we're f set free from condemnation. Let me see, where was I? Uh, so he's the light of the world. The point is, we want to follow him. He set an example. Some people say, I've heard some teachers say, that Jesus is not our example, that Paul is our example. Paul set a great example for us too. But Jesus set the example. Uh, Paul wasn't perfect. How could he set the example? Jesus was perfect in every way. Paul first wanted to murder the church. And then secondly, after he became a Christian, uh, he, he wrote in, uh, in Romans, Oh, wretched man that I am. I'm still struggling with sin. Jesus never struggled with sin. Jesus is our example. And we learn from what he, how he lived and what he taught to how, that's how you should try to live your life. Are you going to do as well as Jesus? It's impossible because he lived a perfect, sinless life. But if you're going to have a role model, an example, it is Jesus. But that's not the primary reason he came down from heaven and became a man. He says, he came to give his life as a ransom. God couldn't die. He had to become a man in order to die. So then it says, uh, verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said unto him, thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Uh, Jesus talked earlier about him when he gives a record of himself that, hey, that's no reason to, to believe it. Believe it because of the testimony of the Holy Spirit of God and because of John the Baptist. He said that earlier. Now they're saying, oh, you're bearing record of yourself. And he says, well, I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. I know whence I came. He came down from heaven. So then it goes on to say, ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. He's not judging us. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, uh, freeing us from judgment and condemnation. Uh, and and he's, verse 16, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. Uh, verse 70, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, 
ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. So uh, every time he starts talking about his father, you know, the Jews don't want to kill him even more. So I'm sure this will really fire them up. Verse 20 says, these words spoke Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then Jesus said again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. He's revealing more and more about who he is. God is his very father. He is not of this world. And he says in verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So they've got to believe his claims are true, that he is, uh, um, that God is his very father, that he is the son of God, uh, that he did come down from heaven. And he says, if you do not believe this, you will die in your sins. Verse, verse 25, then said they unto him, who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. So he's been saying this all along. We're on chapter 8, but many times before we've talked about his claims and the fact that they wanted to kill him. Why? Because he's claiming that he's God. And they said, if you say God's your father, then you're making yourself equal with God. That's blasphemy. And they wanted to stone him. They want to throw him off a cliff. And of course... They're not able to do it because it's not the right time for him to die yet. Uh, but now he says, he's been saying the same thing from the beginning. And verse 26 says, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he sp spake to them of the Father. They don't understand so much because so many things that Jesus has been talking about all along in this book. How many times can we give examples now of them not understanding his spiritual language? Uh, Nicodemus, how can I go back into my mother's womb? Jesus said, you don't understand spiritual language? The, the woman at the well, uh, give, give me this, what is this living water? Well, she didn't understand spiritual language. He is living water. He is life everlasting. Uh, they, 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 they wanted to leave him. Just his disciples deserted him because he says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they said, we're not cannibals. He's, he must, he's a madman. And again, he says, you don't understand. I'm speaking in spiritual language. And here again, he keeps on telling them, uh, Father and I are one. If you see me, you see the Father. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and now he's saying he came down from heaven. They don't understand. They, who are you? Why don't they get it? They don't have spiritual eyes, but they do recognize his claim of uh, equality with God. And that's why they want to kill him. That's why he ends up being killed. That's why Caiaphas tears his clothes and says, blasphemy, we've heard enough. Take him to Pilate. So, uh, because he's, he's claiming that he is the son of God, making him equal with God. So now, um, verse... Uh, Verse 29, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. That's good. Many believed on him. That's a cycle, though. Many believe, and then many people don't understand, and then they leave him, they desert him again, and then many more people believe, 
Verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now a disciple is different than a believer. A believer is someone who believes Jesus' claims. He's God. He's the Savior. He died for our sins. He has the power over life and death. He gives eternal life to everyone who puts their faith in him. Um, these, this is what, how we believe in Jesus. But a disciple is someone who follows and serves and studies under their student. And so not every believer becomes a disciple. And not every disciple is actually a believer. Take Judas, for example. He was, a, he was a disciple. He followed him for years, and yet he never believed his claims. And verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be, ye shall be made free? See, they just don't understand spiritual language. They're thinking free from being in slaves and in, in chains and uh, like they were in Egypt. Instead, he's talking about bondage to sin and free from condemnation. Uh, verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. So they're in bondage to sin. And, and we're all in bondage to, to sin because of our sin nature. We sin naturally. It's the easiest thing to do for, for a human being. Nobody teaches a little child how to sin, but as soon as they reach a certain age, they start lying, misbehaving, being disobedient. It's natural for us to sin. And only through the power of the Holy Spirit transforming us can we get victory. Uh, but fortunately, even if we continue sinning after we get saved, and we all do, just it's just a question of to what degree. Everybody continues sinning. Some people do it more than others. Some people do it more openly. It's more blatant. Some people do it less, and some people do it more secretly. You will never admit it. But if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. So uh, it says, um, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. They've been seeking to kill him now for chap several chapters. And it's all because his claims are blasphemous in their, in their opinion. Third, verse 38, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did, this did not Abraham. Let me read verse 40 in the Amplified, see if it helps. Um, says, but, but as it is, you want to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this is not the way Abraham acted. Okay, so Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him righteousness. And they're not believing God, manifest in the flesh, in Jesus Christ, they're not believing him. Uh, verse 42, Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, Ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. See, this proceeded forth is one of the statements that we find in some of these creeds when it talks about the Godhead. Uh, the, it says that uh, the Holy Spirit proceeded from and, from Jesus and from God. First, it was the Holy proceeded Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father, and then with further debate, they said in a new creed. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. But here we see that they, uh, 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 is, I proceeded forth and came from God. Jesus came from God. He is the same substance of God. Uh, homoousis means the same substance, the, the same essence. He is the essence of God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? See, here he goes. Here he goes again. 
he said this numerous times, you don't understand me. Why are you so dense? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil. So he's saying their father is the devil. Not that they're literally the devil's their father. He, the devil did not beget them. But he's, the, he's their father in, in the sense that they are in agreement with the devil. They're thinking like the devil instead of uh, the way they should. Ye and your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. He was a murderer from the beginning. How did he murder? Well, I guess the, the murder that comes to my mind is in the garden. He said to Eve, I guess, he said to Adam and Eve together, he said, did God tell you don't eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And if you'll eat from it, you'll surely die that day? Yes, that's what God said. Well, that's not true. You, you won't die if you eat from it. You'll just be like God and understand good and evil. And if you'll do that, you can be like God and you can then make your own decisions. You can be independent and you choose, choose good or evil. You can choose good. So they believe the devil. This is the first sin, not actually eating from the tree. They sinned before they ate from the tree. They sinned when they first believed the devil and did not believe God. It was the sin of unbelief. And this sin of unbelief is the sin that sends everybody to hell today. Do you believe in the Son? Do you have faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Or do you have the unforgivable sin, the sin of unbelief in the Son? This is the only sin that's not paid for. You must put your faith in Jesus Christ. The difference between people in heaven and hell is not the people in heaven are, are good people, the sin, people in hell are bad people. That's not. Every, everybody in heaven and hell are all sinners. The difference between the people in heaven and hell is belief and unbelief. I'm going to heaven because I believe on Jesus. Do you believe on Jesus? If not, your place is in hell that because that's where unbelievers go. So put your faith in Jesus. Now, let me continue on here. <clears throat> says, um, <clears throat> uh, verse 45, <clears throat> and because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Uh, and because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. That's verse 45. 46, which of you convinceth me of sin? In other words, who of you could say that I've ever sinned? Now, that's the question everybody should be asking each other. Uh, have you ever sinned? If you deny that you're, you're a sinner, that you've sinned, then the Bible says you're a liar. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And Jesus is asking every question. Can you, you're, are you saying I'm a sinner? I've never sinned. No one can make that claim except Jesus Christ. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. That's the question. Do you have ears to hear? Do you have spiritual ears? Are you humble? Do you want to, are you seeking God? Do you want to know the truth? Do you want to receive the free gift of salvation? If you have that desire, then you can understand these things. If you're full of pride and you're all puffed up, you're not going to understand this. And that's what Jesus is telling them. Verse 48, then answered the Jews and said unto him, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. Uh, let me read that in the Amplified, verse 48. It says, the Jews answered him, are we not right when we say you are a Samaritan and that you have a demon and are under its power? Yeah, so now they're going to start uh, saying he's uh, demon possessed. Maybe we'll get into the uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit next. If I, It seems like they're getting into that topic. Uh, but that's their answer. Instead of believing him, believing in him, there now they just start accusing him, saying, no, you, 
you must be a Samaritan. A Samaritan is a, is a big insult because um, you had three classes of people. You had the Jews and you had the non-Jews who are called Gentiles. Every non-Jew is a Gentile. And Gen Jews were not supposed to intermarry or mix with Gentiles. But when they did, their offspring were not neither Jew nor Gentile. They were referred to as Samaritans. And they were low, low scum in the Jews' eyes. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They were dogs. Uh, and, uh, and so they were calling him a Samaritan. And he's saying that he is... Uh, 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 the devil, he says that you have a demon. Uh, verse 50, and the KJV says, And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. So they're saying, wait a second. Uh, Abraham died. You know, are you saying that you're you're better than Abraham? That's what they get next in verse 53. It says, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? I mean, can you can you blame them? If they don't believe him. If they did not believe him, then it's only natural for them to say, you're insane. You're full of pride. You're making outrageous claims. You know, you're claiming that you're the son of God. You're, you're claiming that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, if, if, we get, if we believe on you, we're going to have life and, and that uh, you know, we won't die. And yet Abraham and all the prophets died. You're making yourself greater than all of them. And... So they either, it's just like the C.S. Lewis. If you haven't read C.S. Lewis books, I suggest you, you get some. Uh, he had some very good ones. Uh, I think it was in Mere Christianity. He made the point. He said, uh, some people say they think Jesus was a great prophet, a great spiritual uh, leader, a teacher, great moral man. Uh, but not God. And 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 C.S. Lewis says, Jesus does not leave you that as a possibility. That is not even, could not even be one of the possibilities because of his claims. And this is what we're seeing here. He's made all these claims and they, they're not reacting like, well, you're a really good man. Uh, uh, we don't believe your claims, but you're a good man. You're a good prophet. And you're a great moral teacher. No, you have to either conclude Jesus claimed to be God manifest in the flesh. He claimed that he came down from heaven. He claimed he's the, the savior. He claims he has power over life and death. If you believe in him, you'll, you'll have eternal life. So you either have to conclude that, no, he couldn't possibly be a moral man unless that was true. He's either telling the truth and he is God and savior, or he's an insane person. He really believes that, but it's not true. He's insane. Or he's not a moral te uh, teacher. He's actually immoral, deceiver, and evil because he's purposely lying to everybody and trying to deceive them. Those are your only options. He is our Savior God, or he's insane, or he's a liar and deceiver. You cannot say... He's not, he's not God and Savior. Uh, he's just a good moral teacher. That's the, that's the way that C.S. Lewis explained it. You, you must choose. Who do you say Jesus is? But this is getting down to the nitty-gritty with him and these, this crowd here. Um, verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Uh-oh. He said, his father is the one you say is your God. Verse 55. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. 
Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. See, they're gonna they're not gonna miss the 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 the, the truth in that statement. He's saying that Abraham saw him, and he's a young man. In verse 57, then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? See, Abraham has been dead for, uh, oh, let me see, when did Abraham die? Let me see. Before Jesus, it was like David was a 1,000 years. So Abraham, probably 1,500 years. So Dave, Abraham's probably been dead for 1,500 years. And he said that Abraham has seen him. That doesn't add up. So they said, then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Okay, let's look at verse 58 in the in the cage in the amplified jesus replied i assure you and most solemnly say to you before abraham was born i am and there's a footnote h says i am the one who is the lord yahweh i am is a name for god it's a title for god it's a it's the name that god answered when G, when uh, when moses asked him his name he said i am that's his name. And Jesus was taking that name for himself. And that's why, look at the next thing that happens. Verse 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Okay, uh, I'm going to end at the end of this chapter 8. And uh, let me sum this up, though. This is a very, very important for this chapter to reveal Jesus' claims and how these people reacted to his claims. Some believed, said, many believed, but many didn't, and they challenged him, and they, they felt that his claims were blasphemous. He's claiming deity. He's claiming that he's God. And they they say it. That uh, they, he, they know very clearly when he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. Before Abraham was, I am. These are all claims that can be taken no other way, but he's claiming to be God himself. That's blasphemy. He's just a man. Let's kill him. They've been seeking to kill him for some time. But as the scripture says, it's not yet time. Well, as I've been going through this chapter 8, uh, you probably got much of what I would like to tell you about the gospel. Uh, but I, I close every one of my broadcasts with a short gospel invitation, I want to invite you, I'll offer you the free gift of salvation. Now, when I say free gift, that means that the salvation and eternal life are offered to you as a free gift from Jesus. Did you know that this announcement here, I mean, this, this teaching here tonight was, was accompanied by a free gift for you? It's the greatest gift ever. It is eternal life in heaven. Do you, do you, have you ever dreamed of going to heaven someday? Living forever in heaven? Do you want to? Do you know what is required of you so that you can go to heaven? Most people tell me, well, I, I, if I'm good enough, I'll get to heaven. I'll, I'll join religion, be religious, follow religious rules, be a good person, and so on. And if I'm good enough, God will let me in. That's the philosophy of the world. All the religions of the world are based upon that premise, the merit system. They think that God has some kind of a scale of justice and all your good, de good deeds are put on the scale and all your bad deeds. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad, the scale tilts in your favor and you get in. That's a lie from the devil. That's not what the Bible says. That's the philosophies of men. The reason that can't work is because it, it, to go to heaven, you must be sin-free. Heaven is a sin-free zone. You can't take your sin up to heaven and pollute it. So sin has to be removed. You, you can either go to God with no sin on you and say, I've lived a perfect life, I've never sinned once, and then you can get in. But if you think you can do that, you are deluded. If you understand that's impossible, then you'll say, well, what's my hope? I have no hope at all. The good news is Jesus is our Savior. The Bible says he is God Almighty. He came down from heaven and became a man in order to die for our sins. 
He succeeded. He died on the cross, paying for all of our sins. Now we get to go to heaven if we'll trust him. He also raised himself from the dead. He was buried for three days. He raised himself back to life to give us a sign, to give us proof that his claims are true. He is God. He is Savior. He does have power over life and death. Thank you, Jesus, for that resurrection. That's what gives us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. So if you want to go to heaven, um, we're not asking you to join a religion. I'm not asking you to become a religious person. I'm not asking you to follow some set of religious rules. I'm asking you to trust a person to save you. Rely on him. Depend on him completely. You can trust him because he is God, Savior. God manifest in the flesh. This icon right here shows you a picture. That, that's the micro, the cameras. You see that? That's a picture of Jesus reaching out to you and wanting to embrace you and take you up to heaven, give you eternal life. And that if you want it, then just reach up and embrace him with faith. Say, I'm trusting Jesus. But if you're trusting yourself, if you're believing in yourself to get to heaven, go ahead and try. No one has succeeded. Jesus said no one has ever gone up to heaven, come down from heaven but him. You need him. All right. Thank you for watching. And uh, uh, I'll, next time we study the book of John, we'll begin with chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, please join me nightly for these broadcasts live, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.